Afternoon, Singapore. It's Lim Tian after work again on another very, very busy day. The second day of the campaign. But you know, my friends, the battle is heating up. The battle is heating up. And now uh, it's wonderful to see the reaction of the electorate. People know that people's voice has got such an amazing opportunity to kick out the PAP's team in Jalan Besar. And I cannot even begin to describe the exuberance of the, uh, the reactions, the spirit of the people in Jalan Besar. And everywhere we are going now, and we were doing walkabouts today, you know, in the Boon King area, and amazing reaction. And we are going to increase that intensity over the next one week, I assure you. But I want to tell you something that happened this afternoon. And I found out that CNA is organizing a debate tonight with four parties, the PAP, the PSP, the WP and the SDP, and excluding PV. And their reason is, oh, we will invite only the top three opposition parties with the most number of candidates. That is so ridiculous, my friends. That is absurd and that is disgraceful because I am the opposition figure who has been constantly calling for debates for the past two to three years with PAP ministers none of whom have dared to accept my challenge. And I reissued that challenge a few days before the writ of election was announced. But, you know, when the elections were first announced, CNA kept mum about a debate. And we must be one of the few countries in the world where there is no scheduling of debates before elections are pronounced. Everything is last minute. For example, yesterday we were told to hand up the scripts for the party political broadcast, and we were told that our recording would be between three to four in the afternoon. When our personnel went to hand in the script, they were suddenly told, oh, the recording will take place at 7 a.m. in the morning. Can you believe this? And this is how they treat opposition parties during an election. They make you scramble everywhere, all right? And the period for election is already so short, but they make you scramble. I don't think that is the way democracy should be practiced. That is not the way democracy should be practiced in a first world nation. And that is to the detriment of the people. But jolly well, if they do not want me in the debate, what does that show? It shows that they are afraid of people's voice, aren't they? They are very afraid. And that is what I have been saying all along. They will never mention PV or my name unless absolutely forced to. They will mention the other opposition parties' names, even parties that are smaller, that are more insignificant than us. They will highlight the leadership. Why? Because at the end of the day, they are not afraid of them. They know that the real threat to the PAP is PV. And it is a time-honored tactic that you do not give prominence to your most feared opponent. That was a tactic adopted by Napoleon. Napoleon would often speak well of opponent generals whom he was not afraid of. But of the generals he was really afraid of, he would never mention them in public. Let me come on now to another topic which caught my attention today. It was reported that 
a PAP candidate who was standing in these elections holds 69 positions, 69 positions in companies. I ask myself, how are you going to devote your time to the public business when you have to devote virtually all your time to the private business of these 69 companies? And I give you the assurance, my friends, I will never allow a member of parliament from PV to devote so much time to private business at the expense of the public business. I do not think that is fair to the Singapore people who pay MPs good money, $16,000 a month to be an MP. We in PV believe that that MP allowance should be reduced. Our parliament sits for only a few days every month. I believe that there are some months when the parliament does not even sit. We are not like the British parliament when it is in session. When MPs are in attendance almost every single day. So our MPs already span relatively little time in parliament. I am one who advocate that if you are an MP, you should spend at least half of your working time on parliamentary attendance and debates. Let me give you an example. I mean, give, give you an explanation of how parliament came into being. And as you know, the House of Commons in Britain is the mother of all parliaments. And in the old days, members of parliament travel from all over Britain to London, where the House of Commons is situated. And they would meet there. And they were supposed to bring the views and the issues of their constituents from all over the country for discussion and debate in a central chamber known as the House of Commons. And so their duty is to their constituents. Yes, then you have party politics, which intervenes. You have the whip system, whereby members have to follow the directions of their party. But that should not prevent discussions of issues which are of central importance to your constituents. The whip is usually put in place on important issues such as budgetary matters. There may be other matters where the whip is in place, but it is usually for critical matters such as the budget. And perhaps when a motion of no confidence is called in a government, many prime ministers from all over the Commonwealth allow their members of parliament from their party to vote their conscience and remove the whip. Now, in a country like Britain, parliament sits from Monday to Thursday. And members of parliament go back to their constituencies where they hold so-called surgeries on Fridays and the weekends. The surgeries are the equivalent of our meet the people session held by our MPs here, the MPS, they call them. So after parliament concludes its sittings on a Thursday, the members of parliament would travel back to their constituencies by car, by train on a Thursday evening. And then they would spend Friday meeting their constituents. Some may even hold surgeries on Saturdays, meet their constituents. And then on a Sunday evening or a Monday morning before Parliament resumes in the afternoon, they go back to London. So you can see a member of Parliament in Britain spends relatively a lot of time with their constituents. 
And that is the way it must be. We cannot have MPs holding 69 positions in private companies. Tell me, where are you going to have the devotion to the public business? If my MP, if a member of parliament from PV wants to be a full-time member, I totally encourage that. I say, good for you. You are a devoted public servant. But if you do not want to be a full-time MP, I want to see you devoting at least 50% of your working time to the public business. And that means attending to your duties as members of parliament. I find it inexcusable that our parliament is so empty on too many occasions. And that is treating parliament with disrespect. It is treating parliament with mockery. And parliament, as we know, is the people's house. You know, there have been so many occasions in the past when you check Hansard, the public document of parliamentary debates, you find PAP MPs who have asked hardly any questions in the five-year tenure as an MP. I mean, how can you go through four or five years without, with, without asking hardly a question? All right? Don't tell me that your duty is just to sit there and listen. Your duty is to sit there, listen, deliberate, and debate. Today also, I came across a story that Tamasek has lost $126 million in a Thai airline. I think it's called Knock or something like that. You know, it's one of those um, business ventures again, investments again, where Tamasek has lost money. All right. And as many people have said, you, Tamasek seems to be losing money in many, many investments. Well, maybe it makes a lot of money in other investments, but as far as I'm concerned, we rarely hear about that. I suppose bad investments are sensational news and we tend to hear more about that. But again, I find it ludicrous that the investment returns of our sovereign wealth fund or sovereign wealth funds, because GIC is the other sovereign wealth fund, that they are not more transparent. For example, I have always complained that GIC should not be permitted to report returns on a 20-year average. That is ridiculous. That is ridiculous. And um, we must change the system, my friends, because you know why? Your CPF is affected. The rate of return of our money in GIC affects your CPF. It affects how much you have in order to live on till you die, basically. And they have changed the rules on so many occasions. From return CPF at 55, now you're going to get your last installment when you're 90. And why is that Singaporean not allowed to know what are the real returns of GIC year on year? Because that Singaporean is a stakeholder in GIC. Never ever forget that. All your CPF money goes to GIC for investment. All right? And I want to correct a misperception here. 
Tamasic actually does not invest your CPF money. It is GIC that does. And you know something else which people, many people don't realize? GIC can only invest overseas and not locally. And that is another objection I have because there is no reason why our pension funds and CPF is the equivalent of pension funds should not be invested in local companies. You know, one of the reasons why a stock market will rise is very often because of the huge investments made by the pension funds. And you find that in Singapore, you do not have that boost to the local companies that are listed because all the pension funds are invested overseas, right? And PV is a party that wants to promote the growth of local companies. And I do not understand what is the thinking that the monies belonging to local Singaporeans are not invested by a sovereign wealth fund in local companies, but are used instead to invest overseas. I see there are a lot of comments about conflicts of interest. Um, whenever I talked about sovereign wealth funds. Yes, my friends, conflicts of interest is a real problem in Singapore. I mean, you look at the um, number of spouses of ministers who occupy top positions in public establishments. Yes, the PAP may say they are selected on merit it is meritocracy at, you know, at work. But I'll tell you something. In a different country like England, there would be a real problem because they have very strict codes of conduct, strict codes of practice regarding conflicts of interest, which somehow the PAP don't think is appropriate to apply in Singapore. I'm going to leave it at that because I want to attack one other big problem that Singapore faces and which I talked about in my speech at the nomination center yesterday. It is the gross inequality. It is the obscene inequality that we face in Singapore. You know, a cleaner earns about $1,200 a month. That makes the annual salary about $14,400. The Prime Minister has a salary of about $2.2 million a year. I worked that out. <clears throat> the Prime Minister earns about 159 times that of a cleaner. And ask yourself, do you think that is fair? You know, a few years ago, Ong Yi Kang talked about inequality and said that it was one of the most important things that the government had to address. Well, the PAP seem to have um, gone off that discussion totally because 18 months ago, Oxfam came out with a report that ranked the PAP as one of the top 10 governments in the world, bottom 10 governments in the world, in its commitment to fighting inequality. And then you had Desmond Lim, Desmond Lee, sorry, come in to defend the government with totally irrelevant answers. And then, worse still, you had Josephine Teo my opponent, PV's opponent in Jalan Besar GRC, come out to say 
inequality actually was a sign of success of the Singapore system. That really is mind-boggling. Because how can you justify that type of gross inequality in a society? And which is what I have always said, my friends, the PAP at the right, at when you analyze it, the PAP at the end of the day in as, is an extreme right-wing government that believes in trickle-down economics. Make the rich as rich as possible and hope that their wealth trickle down to the rest of society. But what have we gotten all these years? We have gotten crumbs, which is why you see that about 20% of our population actually live below the poverty line. Not that there's a poverty line in Singapore, but they actually belong to the category that we can call poor. That is not a first world nation. The PAP refused to introduce schemes like a minimum wage that will have a tremendous effect in reducing inequality. It is because we do not have a minimum wage in Singapore. That is the reason why you find that employers want to employ cheap foreign labor. If you have a minimum wage, that employer would be far less inclined to employ a foreigner. Because after all, a foreigner and a Singaporean worker is going to cost him the same because of the legal minimum wage in place. And that is a major concern, a major cause of why our local Singaporeans are losing out to foreigners in terms of jobs. My friends, at the end of the day, it will take a people-centric party like People's Voice that fights for the interests of the common man to introduce schemes like a minimum wage, a living wage, to fundamentally readdress the problem of inequality in our society. And if you look throughout the world, it is the parties that fight for the common man who have always introduced these schemes. It has never been the party for the rich and the privileged who will take the initiative to introduce schemes like that. For example, you look at the Labour Party in Britain, which was formed in 1900 to represent the interests of the working class. The founder, Keir Hardy, was a coal miner himself. And you know, in 1945, when the Labour Party took over the government after the end of the Second World War, it came out with what was a brilliant idea and is now one of the shining jewels in the public institutions in Britain. It came out with the National Health Service. And so you have universal health care in Britain. It was the brainchild of a person by the name of Anran Bavin, himself a product of the working class. And it was the Labour Party again, five decades later, that introduced the minimum wage in Britain. 
you are not going to have these things come out from scholars, from generals. All right, you are not going to have these things that benefit the common man coming out from the elite and the establishment. And the same thing happened in the United States. It took Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president during the Great Depression, a man born into immense wealth and privilege, but who had the courage to introduce a minimum wage in 1938 when the United States was still in the Depression and not out of it yet. And they call him a radical president. He was born with wealth, with riches, but he always thought about that common man, that working class person. And that's why some people call him a traitor to his class. But he lifted America out from the depression when America was on his knees. And at the end of the day, we have to recognize one thing. You can talk about trying to readdress inequality or you use a false argument like what Taman does, that social mobility, that social escalator. Yes, you can spend years talking about that. And actually that common man, instead of moving up on that social escalator, is always moving backwards. You need a party like People's Voice that will push for a minimum wage, that will push for eventual universal health care and universal education. Because why should we... I'm sorry, the video is off. Hitch, my friends. I am told that it was a problem with Facebook. Nothing at our end, but I'm glad we are back live again. And I was saying earlier, you need political parties to put in place schemes that will fundamentally readdress the balance and make our society a more equal society. We are for capitalism. Don't, don't, don't think for a moment that people's voice is not for capitalism, but it must be capitalism with a human face. Capitalism, if left unchecked alone, if you let the market run riot, is going to create gross inequality. And I think the experience of the world in the last 40 years, when this so-called theory of neoliberalism, practiced by Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan and the Lee Kuan Yew, and then the Go Chok Dongs, and worse still, Lee Hsien Long in the last the better part of the last two decades has just been detrimental to the cohesion of society. It has been detrimental to the welfare of the great many. We must have a fundamental redress. And I do not see why Singapore cannot move eventually to having universal health care, universal education. Don't and come and give me all that rubbish that we cannot afford it. All right? We spend a quarter of a billion dollars providing free education for foreigners every year. Why do we have to do that? The argument is always, oh, we have to bring in good talent. Yes. At the same time, you are sacrificing a lot, a lot of great local talent. Many Singaporeans in the past could not afford to go to university. They had to start working to support their families. I want Singaporeans like that to be able to go to university and not lose out to foreign students. You know, when I got, went on on this topic last year, I was pothmarked by Ong Yi Kang. I let it go. But at the end of the day, I was talking about the scholarships available to local students compared to scholarships available to foreign students. But he, he chose to change the subject. 
Instead, he said, oh, no, it's not true because we spend $13 billion on education a year for local students. That is not the point, is it? My point is how much do you actually spend on local scholarships for local students? And you compare that to how much you spend on scholarships for foreign students. And I think Singapore students are losing out. Why is their government spending so much on scholarships for foreign students? You ask any Singaporean who has gone overseas to study, whether it be in the United States or in England or in Australia, and do the governments there spend as much proportionally on foreign scholarships? The answer is no. The answer is no. And I don't care what type of arguments you come up with. I am saying you are losing a lot of your local talent by not sponsoring, by not allowing your local talent to go to universities. And I am sad. I am sad that in so many respects, Singaporeans are not getting the support they should be getting from their government. And I am very sad because I believe and my party believes that if you are a citizen of Singapore, you should have the highest political status. Let's never forget that citizenship is a political status. And as a citizen, you deserve the utmost respect and the best treatment from your government. And you should never lose out to any foreign alien in anything. I'm going to stop there, my friends. I, I am somewhat losing my voice. Not that I will lose my voice completely, but I want to save my voice a bit. But I'm going to take several questions. And um, I hope you, know, you have found this um, discussion useful again and educational. And I'm going to be speaking throughout this campaign period for the next eight days. So we will have many, many opportunities. Um, I have one question here from Aru Siva. The GRC should be abolished. I, I totally agree, Aru. I totally agree. I think this GRC system, to me, is such a fraud, right? It is such a fraud. Because you look at um, a system whereby the PAP thinks that if it has a strong minister, he can bring in with his coattails many, many weak candidates. I, I give you a recent example, Ivan Lim the PAP candidate who was eventually forced out of the contest. He was supposed to be a candidate in Jurong GRC. All right. And then there's one other candidate, I don't want to name him now, who's also standing in Jurong GRC. At the end of the day, are they deserving candidates? You know, are they brought in simply because there is a relatively strong minister helming that GRC. I think at the end of the day, there is no substitute for every candidate going toe to toe with his opponent. That way you are able to tell your constituents, I have won on my own merit. And because people think that I am a better candidate than my opponent. You know, in a GRC, you can actually lose your ward, all right? But still, you go in because of the combined result. 
And I think that is unfair. Thank you, Aru. Thank you for asking that question. Edward Singh has made a comment. Lim Tian, please invite Zhou Tio to an open debate on policy through social media. I'll be happy to, Edward. And I issue the challenge to her now. Ms. Tio, will you come out and openly debate me on the range of relevant issues that concern Singaporeans? Your ministerial colleagues have so far not had the courage to do so. And I am issuing this challenge to you now to come out and openly debate with me on labor issues, on housing issues, on a myriad of other issues that Singaporeans are concerned about. Someone also commented, says the PAP thinks that if you have insufficient MediSafe, it means you don't work hard enough. I think this is such a nonsensical concept. You know, my friends, there were many first generational Singaporeans, pioneer generation, who when they worked, worked for very little. And of course, they don't have enough CPF. And they are in the plight they are in today. Because CPF alone is not able to sustain them. How can you, when the average CPF payout is only $355 a month? And you know, there was a NUS study done last year that suggested that the minimum for any person to survive on in Singapore is $1,378. So of course, we should be talking about a minimum wage that is in excess, that is above $1,378. Because by the time you take away the CPF contribution, all right, of 20%, <laughs> You know, you still need $1,378 to survive. Why do you think it is that we have people in their 70s and 80s still struggling to make a living? Because CPF is insufficient. And I have said this before, and I'm going to repeat this. When I was a young man in my 20s, I thought CPF was a scam. I could not believe it when I heard Go Chok Tong tell Singaporeans when he was Prime Minister. I can't remember what year that was now. He was telling Singaporeans then, if you have $32,000 as a minimum sum, you would be able to retire comfortably. And I was in my 20s. And I thought to myself, how is that possible? And today, what is the minimum sum? Today, the minimum sum is $181,000. And for those who were operating on the basis that if you had $32,000 as a minimum sum, you could retire comfortably. That has turned out to be false, isn't it? And it is sad, but Singaporeans have been fed a lot of false narratives about the CPF by the PAP throughout the years. Which is why today, so many Singaporeans are not able to retire comfortably. And we must change that system. Eng Huang, you said, Ong Yi Kang actually said PAP is trying to achieve lower inequality, but it is still in process. And you went on to say, what a joke, as we know that inequality is widening over the years. Absolutely right. We are becoming a more unequal society as the years go by. You know what I would do if I was in Lee Hsien Loong's position? I would take the first step. I would show the first example. I would slash the prime minister's salary by 70%. I have worked out the figures. 
that still gives the prime minister a salary of six hundred and sixty thousand dollars a year and you know what's the next highest earning prime minister in the world it is the australian prime minister who earns five hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year so the singapore prime minister even after he takes a 70 percent pay cut is still going to be earning more than a hundred thousand dollars than his australian counterpart i think that is a very very comfortable salary to survive on to live on maybe not for the pap maybe not for go chok tong who thinks that anyone who earns less than five hundred thousand dollars is mediocre yes i'm afraid the standards of pv and the standards of the pap are very far apart we certainly don't think that anyone who earns less than five hundred thousand dollars is mediocre but we are going to keep reminding people about that and in huang as i had said earlier we cannot expect inequality to address itself if we leave it alone that is not possible in a capitalist society let's not bring in nonsensical concepts like meritocracy and all that and Taman's social mobility or social escalator all right that doesn't address the problem at all the only way you can address inequality in society is by redistribution but that is something the pap refuses to do it refuses to introduce a minimum wage a living wage it refuses to move towards eventual universal health care it refuses to introduce universal education those are the things you need to do if you are serious about addressing inequality thank you <laughs> Paul Fernandez, <laughs> you make a brilliant comment. Tian, it is also disgraceful hearing an MP talk about menstruation and sanitary pads, and the minister still having a good laugh over it. <laughs> well, I know the MP you're referring to. Many people express the same sentiments when those comments were made in Parliament. Um, I have a very great. I have a very good friend by the name of Thiaga. I'm sure Thiaga is uh, is watching. Um, you know, uh, I'm in the same chat group as Thiaga, and uh, when those comments were made, he immediately WhatsApp me and said, "You know, Tian, I can't believe that an MP is talking about sanitary pads in Parliament. You know, it, it is disgraceful. It is demeaning." All right, you shouldn't be bringing up such examples. So I, I agree with you, Thiaga. You know, I agree with you. I have a question here from Sandra, and can I treat you? And can I treat this as the last question for the day, please? I've got so many questions, but I will try to cover the other topics in other sessions. And Sandra Lang asks, "How can we revise MP and ministers' pay and allowances?" Sandra, very easy very easy if the ministers and the mps want to do that they can do it like that they can pass the relevant regulations relevant laws motions whatever for example jacinda arden was quite recently offered a pay raise and she refused it in fact i think she chose to take a pay cut you can determine it for yourself. If I'm Lee Sien Long and I am concerned about the inequality in, in society, I will tell the nation I am voluntarily taking a 70% pay cut. I'm going to put the rest of the money if, the, if, if you know, the people still insist on paying me this, 
or a committee still insists on paying me this, I'm going to put it into a fund that will fund education, that will give relief to the poorest in society. If I'm an MMP, and I think that 16,000 is too much, and I think maybe I should halve that, why can't I contribute the rest to a fund that will help the poor and the needy? We don't need a lot of mechanisms in order to, to, to effect that, Sandra. We can even do it voluntarily. I hope I have answered your questions to the best of my abilities, and uh, I hope you have found this session fruitful and productive again. And um, I will see you tomorrow at 5 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching.